Welcome back, everyone, um, to this uh, thematic session, the first part of the Climate Change Resilient Agroecosystems. And this uh, session will be about integrated landscapes approaches for agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. We already got a very good introduction to that topic by, by Minister Pulgar Vidal in the, in the opening. Uh, my name is Peter Holmgren. I am Director General for the Center for International Forestry Research. Uh, one of the centers uh, of the CDIR, and I'm very pleased to have a distinguished panel uh, that will help us with a live dialogue. I don't think this will be very much of a presentation, it will be a live dialogue, and we have very, a very competent panel to, to have a dynamic uh, discussion about this topic. Uh, starting with Minister Manuel Pulgar Vidal, Your Excellency, welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you for your opening remarks. Um, we look forward to Lima, we look forward to Paris, and we know that you're the captain of the ship, so wow. very welcome. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Christian Samper, uh, CEO and, and president of the Wildlife Conservation Society, very distinguished uh, authority on environmental conservation and environmental policies, very happy to have you here. You're also the chair of the Board of Trustees at Biodiversity International, another of the CG uh, centers. Uh, Professor Bina Agarwal, Professor of uh, Economics and uh, Development Economics and Environmental Environment at the University of Manchester, and you're also the, a Professor of. Um, uh, uh, oh, did I get this right? Also oh. in economics, yes. <laughs> yeah. Economics. And, and you're the president of the Institute International Association of Ecological Economics. That's very, very interesting, and I'd like to hear more about that. So welcome to the panel. And uh, Dr. Kwesi Atakra, director of the CJR Research Program on Integrated Systems for the Humid Tropics. That's, if you say that to somebody outside the CG, that looks really big. <laughs> it's, of course, very important, and this is uh, where we integrate things, the systems thinking, and we look forward to hear you uh, talk about this. And also, Quiz is, is, is an agriculture scientist with a, with a degree in forestry. I think that's a very good background for this panel. So that's the panel. Um, I'm planning to do this in a, in a very informal way. Uh, we have to, unfortunately, uh, let Minister Pogavidal uh, go to the next important meeting in uh, about half an hour. So <coughs> yes. I think we will be, have, be through the most important part of the discussion by then. But I, I'd like to first uh, say two words about where, where we seem to stand on the landscapes approach. This, this has been a really important week for the planet, actually. It's not often that we have heads of states and heads of government to talk about agriculture and forestry. It's not often that they make commitments to these areas, but that's precisely what they've been doing this week in, in, uh, in New York. And that means that we are expected to deliver on those declarations and action agendas that have been uh, developed. Now, let's take a quick look at the two declarations on agriculture and forestry. If you put them together, and together they make a really compelling action agenda all the things we need to deal with to achieve sustainable development, the land-based sector being at the center of this, uh, and, and uh, preserving the ecosystems being at the center of this. If you take them together, it's really compelling. But if you look at them one by one, there is almost no connection between them. There is no cross-reference. There are institutional structures that leads to one declaration on agriculture, not mentioning forests. There is one declaration on forests without much connection to agriculture except as a problem that causes deforestation, of course. So we have this fragmentation, and we need to figure out how do we develop the combined solutions, because we know that the combined solutions will be better. It will be more than one plus one. How do we develop that? What are the tools, methods? How do we ensure that local people are in charge of the solutions? And as we approach the sustainable development goals, can we avoid to fall into those silos again? What do you think, Christian? Well, thanks, Peter. It's great to be here with several friends that I've interacted with in a number of ways over the years. It's great to see you, Manuel, and of course, Peter, you and I were in C4 together. Um, th this has been an extraordinary week, and uh, if exhausting week here in New York because of all the things going on. Uh, Secretary Kerry had a statement which was interesting about speed dating. It's like going meeting everyone speed dating and you miss <laughs> half your dates, but uh, we're here. Um, but I'm glad that we're having this dialogue. As, as you mentioned, uh, we have to bring these worlds together. I, I come at this actually 
very much from the environmental side as a scientist that's worked in conservation issues, but also as a, as a side interest, I've always been involved with the CG, including C4, and now as, uh, as chair of the uh, Biodiversity International Board. And one of the things I've learned is, I mean, there's all these parallel dialogues going on, and these two worlds, not only between forest and agriculture, between, as Manuel was saying, climate and biodiversity. And they're starting to come together, but um, we've got a long ways to go. And the whole conservation agenda and uh, agriculture uh, needs to weave together. I think we've got an opportunity to really bring those together. I'm very encouraged by the CG and the dialogues that we have, starting to bring sustainability into the debate meaningfully and not only how do we resolve the issues around productivity and nutrition and these areas, but how do we do it in a way that's not going to have a, a huge environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And of course, this week, with everything and all the attention of climate change, I think what we really have to realize is that overlay and the issue of the impacts that uh, the relation between agriculture and conservation and climate change. Let me just give you one specific example that's interesting. In the last three months, I've spent a lot of time in Colombia's an, uh, an advisor to President Santos on a coffee commission, coffee being one of the key crops in Colombia. And uh, uh, the interesting thing, you look at the coffee production sector there, this is a sector that covers where about one and a half million people de derive their income directly from coffee. It's a, as many of you know, the agricultural band is in the Andes. And we're starting to see the impacts of climate change on the system. We're starting to see reduction in yields. We're starting to see all these production systems starting to go up the mountains. And what's happening is as there's increasing pressure on the higher areas, that's where the ecosystem services are coming. So most, 70% of the population of Colombia lives in the mountains. The water of most of these cities comes from these areas that supply not only the coffee in these areas. And we're starting to move up. It's increasing the rates of deforestation, starting to impact the provision of water and water services and it's starting to impact the coffee production itself. And the question is, how can you actually come up with systems and solutions that will allow for adaptation to this climate change and the same mitigate the impacts? And the answers are within the production systems themselves, not only varieties, but in the case of coffee, one of the things we've been looking at is shade-grown coffee. It's an incredible response where you can really, this is, well, the last 20 years, Colombia <coughs> eliminated a lot of the shade-grown coffee for sun coffee. This is what's going up. By going back to shade coffee, you can actually you good production, better markets for some of these things, improve the livelihoods, reduce the deforestation, and increase water production. So there are win-win solutions like that that we really need to look at, and I think there are a lot of examples. So we need to start by doing the dialogue and really focusing on these options, and, uh, and this is what the dialogue is about. So I'm going to just finish because I want to make sure we can have a dialogue. I want to say that I agree with everything Manuel said in the speech about the landscape approach, and I subscribe to all of it. Great. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> and, That's and, easier than repeating and, it. And, uh, we, uh, I guess we should be really, really happy and appreciate the speed dating that has, has led to a political commitment. The question is now, what, how do we handle that political commitment? But I'm going to turn to Bina, because we're all, always a lot of our discussion is about the land and the, pro and, and the biophysical um, things on the land, but there is also the people side of landscapes and, and uh, the governance, the equity, the gender, the migration, etc., etc. How does that fit in? Um, well, I think um, I certainly agree that we need to really look at both production and conservation, and not just for future generations, but also the present generation. Now, in this context, um, as we know, the debate has got polarized because some argue that agricultural intensification for food production must be separated from conservation. There's this whole debate about um, land sparing and land sharing. But I think um, in this debate, um, a central point is missed out. Who gets to decide how the scarce land is to be used? What are the processes by which decisions are going to be made? Uh, and so on. So before I, I talk a little bit on that question, I do want to uh, share with um, you uh, where I stand on the debate. I do believe that we need to move away from the dichotomies of sharing and uh, land sharing and land sparing and seek a more integrated approach um, for many reasons. I mean, firstly, of course, the separation of agricultural intensification and conservation tends to gloss over the fact that agriculture itself offers a lot of scope for conservation. There's issues of um, um, uh, various seed varieties, traditional seed varieties, their knowledge systems, local ecologies, uh, which agriculture contributes, uh, which need conserving. 
then we know there are complementarities between um, across ecosystems, between croplands, between forests, between pastures. And we see this in traditional practices of agroforestry, in, especially in Asia. We see it in the dependence of smallholders on forests for green manure, for soil conservation, for fodder, for water management. And we see it in emerging practices, um, agroecological practices in Brazil, where you have um, uh, local scientists uh, helping farmers uh, to move in that direction, which, which match crops, trees, livestock, and, uh, and poultry. Um, and I also believe we need this because nature, of course, doesn't know boundaries. I mean, we have administrative boundaries, uh, but nature's landscapes are different from administrators' uh, um, landscapes, <clears throat> and we clearly need a mix of the two. So, so in, that, uh, in that context, um, I think we need to ask some hard questions. Uh, for instance, what is the mix of agricultural in intensification and, and uh, landscape integration? How do we bring the context into this? Because local ecologies differ, local country capacities differ, land scarcities differ, there are priority differences. Um, in Asia, as we know, there's a huge pressure on land. We've already reached the extensive margins of cultivation. We're talking about intensific intensification <clears throat> and so on. So the question is that both integration and intensification uh, require skill in, is, are also skill intensive. They're usually knowledge intensive and they're often capital intensive. So can the agricultural systems, extension systems, knowledge systems actually reach the small farmers and especially women, provide them with the skills that would make for a successful agricultural intensification and integration? in environmentally sustainable ways. Now, I think that's a really key question because as came out in the plenary, 70 to 80 percent of our farmers have cultivated two hectares and less. And in, in many countries, more than 50 percent of the farmers happen to, women, happen to be women um, <clears throat> who produce, this is certainly true for large parts of Asia and Africa. They produce a lot of the world's food. But smallholders in general and women in particular don't have access to the, uh, to the technologies, the knowledge systems, the water, the land, um, and of course, uh, connections with markets. Training programs bypass them. Experiments that are done on farmers' fields are never done on women's fields. So if these are high precision practices, how are we going to reach, reach them? Um, and then I want to raise a deeper concern because that hasn't been mentioned. Who will have voice in integrated landscape planning? <coughs> Whose priorities will prevail? Who will decide what to conserve and what to produce? And this is embedded in the very deep social and economic inequalities and power structures. I want to bring that centrally into it, because the most disadvantaged tend to get out of the frame. Um, often we talk about co building consensus. But how do we build consensus across deeply divided communities? Now, I'm not, I'm not raising this because uh, just as a pessimistic aspect, but I, I'm raising it as a realist in order that we find solutions. Um, and I want to make a couple more points, uh, Peter, uh, which is that such planning has to be bottom up, not top down, in order that the small producers feel a sense of ownership of the idea, because that's the only way you're going to be able to sustain it. And here we need to grow, go across beyond blueprints. Now, just yesterday I downloaded, there was a whole action plan, African Integrated Landscape Action Plan, which some of you have seen. And I think it's a very important start. But at the same time, in political terms, you know, the word la landscape is actually very politically neutral. Um, so it, we need to talk about how do, we, how do marginalized communities actually engage with this. Um, and we seem to, I think, to some extent, we've shied away in talking about the landscape approach from this um, aspect of embedded inequalities. So in the Africa report, for instance, if I may just mention, in an excellent report, land grabbing, the solution is put as setting standards for screening investments. Now the assumption is, of course, that the state is a, is a neutral actor for screening and implementation. We know that's not, the, not necessarily the case. In many cases, the state itself is complicit in land grabbing. So there's a very nice, um, way in which some of the grassroots people put it, what if the fence itself wrecks the field, if the water itself ignites the fire? So where do we move from here? I believe we need to introduce two concepts here, the issue of empowerment and the issue of negotiation. 
And how do we actually empower the smallholders, women uh, in particular, in order that they are able to negotiate the terms on which they want to engage in these dialogues? Uh, there are many examples. There's the MST, the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil. Uh, there is the conservation agriculture in southern Africa. There are many examples in India where you have like thousands of women's groups um, who are doing uh, farming collectively. Now, they can form the basis of an empowered dialogue. And so, in a sense, what I'm arguing is that on the landscape approach, we need to have a political economy framework. And it's really knitting the two together, which perhaps um, we need to do in order to move forward to what we all want, which is uh, a world which is pro-conservation, pro-poor, and pro-production. Thank you, Bina. I think, I think you put the finger on something which I personally think is really, really central to the landscape approach. And that is that the approach is really a negotiation approach. Yes. It's a process, it's, it's an approach to decision making, and those decisions need to be local. It is the multiple stakeholders with the multiple objectives on the ground. That, that's really the, the core of, of the landscape approach. Then you can scale that up to a country level too. That's a country is a landscape as well. But the core of it is really what you talk about. Now, this also means that Having it bottom-up means that we have to accept that the solutions, those combined solutions, will be diverse. Yes. And they may not follow what we think through our intelligent design of different uh, farming systems. They may be completely different. Now, Kwesi, how does that fit into the, to the research that we're doing on systems in the CGIR? Are we, are we allowing for the diversity of solutions? Yeah, well, first let me say that, uh, of course, we all agree that agriculture is at the heart of human survival. But there can be no agriculture when we destroy the environment. And therefore, we have to be very conscious that in assessing the productivity of agriculture, it shouldn't be looked at just from the point of view of yield per hectare. I think we've come to the <coughs> point where agriculture needs to begin to think about what is their contribution for ecosystem services, what is their contribution for nutrition in terms of quality, you know, these days when we talk about food security and talk about agriculture, essentially we are only talking about the major global staples. And uh, a couple of days ago we were at a, a meeting in, in DC and... Um, Sorry, you lost your mic, so I think oh. you need to hold it or something. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah, we were at a meeting in DC where we had uh, Prabhi Pingali gave a wonderful presentation to show how policy globally, when it comes to agriculture, seems to be so focused on the few major staples, uh, rather than looking at you know, the broader diversity of nutrient-dense uh, commodities that deal with nutrition, but also that have the environmental concerns uh, in, in mind. So if we're going to do that, we also have to recognize, if we take the case of Africa, Major agricultural regions are located in important watersheds and centers of biodiversity. And agriculture does not stay on its own. There are linkages. There are things from the uncultivated forests which influence what happens within our agricultural landscape. And there are dangers within the agricultural landscape that can affect negatively what happens outside. So it's really a new you know, framework of thinking which has to be at the landscape level where we are able to see the, the effect of agriculture on the wider ecosystem that agriculture is part of. So coming down to the specific question I was asked um, by Peter, in the context of the CGIAR, um, an effort has been made to actually create programs known as the systems, integrated systems programs. There is one on the humid tropics, which I run. There is one on the drylands, and there is one on the aquatic systems. Additional to that, we also have programs that are focusing on things from the natural resource management perspective. One on climate change, one on forest trees and agroforestry, and one on water, land, and ecosystems. Now, the challenge is to make sure that these programs are not functioning as silos, and that we can generate collaboration in terms of integrated actions. And this is what brings in three key concepts when it comes to collaboration at the level of uh, landscapes. First of all, the concept of 
co-location, where we can co-locate a number of these initiatives in the same place so we can really look at the landscape dimensions and be able to study the trade-offs and the interactions across the different components. The second dimension is the dimension of coordination. And I think coordination is a key element. If you're going to do any landscape work, we've got to make sure that there is coordination across the different groups and the different actors. And finally, of course, there is the issue of collaboration. More and more, we need to be able to find mechanisms where the agriculture cluster is working with the forest cluster, is working with the environment cluster, so that we can actually come out with some joint efforts which are aimed at producing this sustainable intensification that we all talk about. So I would basically uh, end by saying that two key concepts that we have heard a lot about, this issue of climate smart agriculture, uh, it is absolutely common sense agriculture. Because if agriculture is going to continue into the future, we've got to find mechanisms to make sure that we are taking into account not just from an adaptation perspective, but also from a mitigation perspective, how agriculture can be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. That's, that's one key element. And the second element is really integrated landscape approaches, making sure that we build those mechanisms all the way to the policy level to support how we can bring the landscape analysis into the concept of agricultural research uh, itself. And finally, and critical, is this whole dimension of engaging the communities through recognizing that the communities are part of this multi-sectoral dimension we talk about. So really coming out with mechanisms that gives voice to the communities to be able to determine the priorities and so for them to be part of whatever solutions that are developed. I think I'll yeah, end on Thank this. you. And that gives us just about enough time to come back to Ms. Minister Polgar Vida, Manuel. And, and uh, I'm going to... Is this still on? I'm going to come back to you with a question that is targeted a little bit to the COP. And from everything we hear, we are talking a lot about integrated solutions, landscape approach, we're talking about climate smart agriculture, we're straddling different political agendas, we have great political support in different agendas from, from this climate week and also from other, uh, const uh, constitution, uh, from, from other constituencies. Fantastic. Now we want to go towards an integrated approach. Now we want to do landscape, we want to do climate smart agriculture. And my question is, have we found a formula to bring these issues together into the negotiation? Have we finally found that path that will take <laughs> agriculture into, into the negotiations? Thank you, thank you, Peter, for that very big and broad question. But <laughs> yeah, I agree that, that, that what we tr uh, should think is how, what should we do to have the landscape approach as the main approach, as the main strategy? So let me take the three comments of, of, of Peter, of Vina, uh, and Christian, sorry, uh, uh, Vina and, and, and Kwesi, because I think that there are three, three very important topics that we should have into consideration. Christian has raised the, an example, the example of the coffee producer in Colombia. And sometimes that kind of examples, it is the low-hanging fruit to try to demonstrate that that integration it is possible. And let me say one thing about of Peru. In Peru, probably most of you have already heard or had what it is our new proud, the gastronomy. And based on gastronomy, you can't imagine how much we are creating relations between forests, between communities, between traditional practices, between agrobiodiversity. That is why Peru is up in a position in which, for example, we are discussing the EMOs, because we feel proud, we have felt proud about our gastronomy and the base of the agrobiodiversity. And that is why we are talking about conservation and, and how the natural protected areas are helping to have this raw material for our food. So, so sometimes it is good examples to try to show the people that it is possible. In Peru, you know that yearly is organizing this very big fair called Mistura that is becoming one of the most popular in uh, Latin America. It is really big, 500,000 uh, people. Yeah, something like that in eight days. That means that the people is connecting not only with the food, with the plate, 
but also with the producers, with the, with the product, and with, us, with the ecosystem. So, so sometimes it is the example. My second reflection, it is more related to what Vina has raised, this old dichotomy, no? the, uh, all the, uh, this old dilemma between conservation, production, among some other. And, and, and my reflection is how much we should do to try to avoid this dichotomy. Because for me, for example, how much the current way we are educating the young or the youth, it is creating the, pro the, 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 the problem. If we maintain the idea of faculty of uh, agronomy and faculty of forestry, there are, are there some way to, to integrate both? Mm -hmm. I, 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 do, do we think that we should do something to put together or to bring some lecture from one to the other to try to think in the future or to try to, 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 to uh, have professionals that are more able to interconnect that? Let me say that also in this dichotomy, how much the traditional way that we have used to organize the government and the public sector are in the base on that dichotomy. And I'm going to say something probably funny. Do we need a Minister of Agriculture and a Minister of the Environment? Or, or, or how can we do to put it together, the forest with the environment and with the agriculture? And fisheries. Be and, and fisheries. And fisheries, fisheries well. probably, yeah. Because that is, that is in the base. You can't imagine how much we are having debate with my colleague, the Minister of Agriculture because there are different approaches. Mm. And, and, and that is not healthy. And, and, and that, is not going, that, that is not creating the condition to have this inter integrating approach. And that moved me also to, to, to the value. For, for me, the discussion about forest and also the discussion about landscape, it is an issue of value. It is the issue, uh, the, the value of the forest and the agriculture, the value of the culture, the value of the traditional uh, practices of, of, of the indigenous communities, the value of, of the climate debate. It is how can we create value in this integration? And that is part, probably, the key issue of this formula to try to, to, to have this approach as the main strategy. And when we see talk about the role of agriculture, but how can we move the agriculture to have into consideration the role in the ecosystem services? I think that through traditional practices, it is a good way to think on that. For example, in case of Peru, the terraces, the andenes, the waruwarus are all traditional practices of agriculture that has had been, uh, had, uh, uh, been developed because of the ecosystem considerations. So, so through that kind of going back to the traditional way of the agriculture, we can create conditions to have more connection between the agriculture, the ecosystem services, and the forest. For example, in Mistura, this gastronomy fair in Peru this year, the organizer put or created an artificial and then to try to show to the people that that is the best way to maintain the ecosystem and to have more varieties of potatoes. So, so that is the connection that, that we need to do. And that is also related to, to what uh, uh, Vina uh, raised, the, 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 the issue of empowerment. Empowerment and negotiation. That, I think that that is key. And that is related to the value. Because the only way to empower people is when they recognize the value of the things. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that, that there are some elements for the discussion, I think this has been a very interesting discussion, and that we are going to create the, the atmosphere to have this uh, approach as part of the main debate. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult. For example, what do you think, Peter? I am now asking to you. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, what, does, <laughs> what does it mean to have a forest declaration here in the summit when we are trying to have a landscape approach. So how much or how does it mean to maintain the traditional division mm. or the dichotomy of different sectors or, or, or how should we do to have in the next summit or in the next COP 
a more strong uh, statement about the landscape. That, 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 that is very key, because it is the only way to move this discussion forward. I know we have to let you go, but I will respond with a question too. <laughs> okay. and, and, and then we can continue the conversation between, between the, the rest of us. And, and that is that there is a little bit of a tension here, because if we agree that integrated solutions are good, we need to prove that the values are higher, we need to prove that the local uh, uh, communities benefit from such and that they are in charge. But there is a little bit of tension here also that if we too much challenge the existing institutional structures, so yes. it may fall back. Uh, and, and therefore, my sense is that it's great value to have a forest declaration. It's great value to have an agriculture de declaration. The question more becomes, how can we build on those existing structures and develop the integrated solution? It's not either or. I think we need to build on them. That's my reply to your questions. And I don't know if you have any final reflections on that. And then, then no, we'll I think in, in these processes, what we need to be is optimistic. Because our processes are processes that take time, are processes that need to have into consideration not only the science, the research, the politics, the policies, the rules, the peoples. So, so, so the only way to create integrated solutions is with integ integral thinkings. So, so, so I think that, that that is the way to have the landscape, the formula for the landscape approach as a main strategy. It is <coughs> if we consider all the possibilities, all the ways to go through that kind of approach. And really sorry that I'm leaving now, I'm with the the president is still, president of Peru is still in, in New York, so I'm going to, to, to be with, with him. Really sorry that I've been delayed and now I'm going <laughs> early, but <laughs> that, that is a busy, it is a busy agenda. It's a speed day. We, we, all, we all appreciate your efforts. We know that a lot depends on it, and, and we're really grateful to have had you here this morning. And, and uh, I think many of us will, will continue to really work with you and for you to make COP, COP a success in no, Lima. No, so thank you. I, I, Thank you, and also thank you to, to, to give me the opportunity to be. Thank you to give me the opportunity to be in this place with very, very and a good friends and Christian and, and, and many other people, and with all the people of C4 and the CEIAR. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. So we don't leave you. I'm okay. not taking the minister's place. I'm just <laughs> <saying it. laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a good intensification uh, measure that you're just how's, doing. How's now. your Spanish? Hablamos en español. I think I think we might have some some intri uh, some questions from the floor at this point. I think that's a good. This is a good point to bring that in. So, microphone, somewhere. Okay, it's coming from the back. Let's start with Pedro at, at the front here. I think you will have a microphone in a second. Yeah, I don't think I need it. Well, they're recording. They're recording. The people you. watching the video. So we need the, we need the proof. Need the uh, but I am a bit amazed at this business that uh, forestry and agriculture are separate entities. Are we going back to Wessie? You were with me at the draft. Are we going back to the, uh, uh, to the, to the late uh, uh, 18, uh, 1980s when this happened, when both uh, ECRAF and C4 joined the CGIR, and ECRAF, the World Agroforestry Center, which I led during the 90s, uh, it's about exactly that. It's about all these uh, all this interactions between trees and crops and very much in the landscape. There's a lot of very good work our people have done so I don't know if there are any e uh, present ECRAF scientists here. And actually, I'm amazed that they're not. But um, as a former DG, I would, I would say, uh, don't forget agroforestry. It's happened, and uh, I think it has a pretty decent track record. Mm -hmm. Let's take a few more comments from the floor. My name's uh, Don McCabe. I'm a farmer from southwestern Ontario in Canada, and I'm here today as the president of the Soil Conservation Council of Canada, and I'm also a vice president of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. I fully uh, appreciate the issue of a landscape approach, but I also find some of the comments up here bordering on annoying. 
the only reality of why staple crops are the only thing that have value right now is because that's what society has decided. That's what the value is. I also find it, uh, where are we at then in having society actually decide that they're going to value a landscape? We have continuing uh, issues of exploitation of land to build housing, which is not considered to be an indirect land use. All the farms that I have have Carolinian forest at the back. They all have biodiversity attached to them. I don't clear trees because I don't have to, but I'm being labeled now as environmental degradation for political reasons of having these things split. I also have to question, Peter, your comment about the challenging of institutions. We don't have a horse and buggy club anymore because we went to cars. So if the institutions can't change to catch up to where egg culture needs to be, then do we need that institution? Because at the end of the day, there's one large link here for everybody. Agriculture, forestry, and everything incurs in a watershed that it shares the same climate shed as the rest of the world. We need leadership from our research to, uh, community to help, uh, help us put the value of what carbon is going back into this ground or what emissions are coming from it. But we also need to come to a full understanding that for egg culture to succeed, our emissions are going to have to grow, but grow with less intensity. And you're not going to do that from a standing old growth forest. You're going to have to accept that they're going to be a constant emission source. So right now, I find the research community is excellent at helping draw the boxes. I don't see you actually doing outreach to make things move. Because until society is willing to accept it has a role to pay in dealing with one landscape, in paying for ecological goods and services, we're going to continue to fill rooms like this and create more emissions while not creating real policy or movement. I would hope that sooner or later we start to have a dialogue that involves the actual people on the ground to get this job done. I appreciate very much what the institutions like this want to do, but you're not growing either. Will you help us get to the issue of giving society a number to work with so we can get policies put through in Lima to finalize in Paris, please? Thank you. Very uh, important comment. Let's uh, I'll have our panelists think about that for a minute. We'll take one more question from the floor. I think somebody back on, on this they wanted to, to comment. Uh, but just to make one quick remark on that, it, it goes back to who's in charge. And it goes back to how do we create the right mm -hmm. policy conditions to, so that those that are in charge can make decisions that they stand up for. So I appreciate that comment. can come back to, to, to yeah. the panel on it in a minute. You have to think a little bit about it. Uh, one, one more comment from here. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Shinpe Murakami. I'm a farmer from Japan. Maybe here is only my farmer. I'm a farmer. So the, I would like to share some experiences. The, I've been working in the Bangladesh and then Thailand around uh, 13 years. And then the, today we are talking about the landscape. And the, about uh, the, uh, there's a pro preservation or a pro the productivities. And then the Actually, the farmers' uh, experience and then the movement in Thailand, I've seen in the 80s, there is one movement which is we call integrated farming. So that is the, it takes place in the uh, place of the called Isan, which is northeast Thailand, where the most of the farmers are doing rice cultivation. Pri uh, the, uh, and then the, it's a land-fed area not so much good irrigation area. There, this, the integrated farming has started. One farmer start to digging the rice field about one hectare and making the, uh, the drainage, I mean, not drainage, the ditch, and they make it the bank in the surroundings. So with hard work, he make the total area of the one hectare digging you know soil and making the bang outside and inside in the water canal with the pond so the rice field is almost the one one half of the you know total area become but he planted many trees first he planted many first growing like you know banana 
and then the uh, papaya, so as well as the many trees, mango trees, coconut trees, and then the guava trees. There are many kinds of tropical trees. They planted in the bands. And then they started, the, when the rainy season has started, all rainwater is harvested there. So he started to release the, raising the fish in the pond. And then when it grows into the, uh, growing up to the rice field, that fish goes to the inside of the, the rice. It was called rice fish culture. Mm -hmm. And then the, they also raise the, some kind of chickens on the pond. And then the chicken, uh, the uh, dunks are dropped to the, uh, the pond. And it's also a feed for the fish. So what happened in five to six years? His farm, it was only monoculture of the, the rice farm, only rain fed, which is, depends on the sky. If good rain, good harvest. No good rain, no harvest. Then, now, he has a, only half of the, you know, the 0.5 hectare, he could get the same amount of the he used to have when the good rain. And then the rain is always harvested. It is no concern for him, the problem of the rain. And then not only the good harvest, but so many fishes in the dry season, they, you know, harvest it and, and then sell it. And so many trees. And then tree when grows, ecosystem <coughs> come back. So this the integrated approach is very become popular in the uh, Thailand and especially sustainable agriculture movement in Thailand. It started from that one. I think that the, there are many the farmers practice, which is now we're talking about. And then the, for the, uh, we call about, I, uh, I'm coming from the ASEAN Farmers Association. I'm this from this, I get a chair of that one. And I came to the Asian Farmers Association, is in a member of the Global Alliance of the uh, Climate Smart Agriculture. So the, uh, here I came here as a farmer. We are talking so many research things, but the, sometimes we found those topics are very far away from the farmer's situation. And the, sometimes we feel farmer has so many, like that's the, uh, the uh, minister from uh, uh, what? Uh, Peru. 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 He said that's the good practice of the traditional farming. Yes. And then the, that's the uh, integrated farming is not depends on the, only the uh, traditional farming, but the idea coming from farmers. So I uh, really appreciate if you, yeah, people in the, here, the, uh, involved in the, this research, come to the you know, real field and learn from there, and also advise your experience and your knowledge. Thank you. I think that's a very good comment on the lines that uh, uh, farmers need to be in charge and that we have a diversity of solutions, but how does that fit with the political agendas that we are all trying to follow or support? So let's come back to the panel. Who is eager to say something for us? Bina, there were a number of comments on, okay. on, the, uh, on the governance and the uh, <laughs> right. rights issues. Okay, well, um, let me make three comments. Um, first, on this relationship between forest and agriculture, I just want to remind people that there are many areas which don't have much of forest. So if you take the landscape of South Asia, then you find that, for instance, Pakistan has very little forest. Bangladesh has rather concentrated pockets of forest. Um, India is very diverse. You have like barely 2% forest in the northwest, where, which, is the, which is the breadbasket um, of the country. And you have quite substantial forests. 86% of the geographic area of some states in the northeast have forests. So, so I think we can't just depend on, when we're talking about integrated landscapes, we can't uh, look at ex existing forests and see how, do, uh, how does agriculture relate to that. We have to move towards new solutions. For instance, the example of agroforestry. Now, agroforestry is, means that you actually re-bring the trees back into the landscape where they've disappeared. Uh, what kinds of trees, in what amounts, how do you negotiate that? I think these are all very valid and very significant questions. Um, now, having raised that, uh, if you take the social landscape, which is that the vast majority of farmers cultivate less than two hectares, 80% have less than two hectares, 70% in India have less than one hectare, 
then they don't want to devote some part of their precious land to forests and some part to poultry and so on. They say, well, we're going to just grow whatever crops bring us the most profit because that's going to bring us livelihood and food security. Is there a solution forward? I do believe there is, but that can come through institutions. For instance, consolidation, cooperation. Um, so what you're seeing in some parts, it's an area that I'm currently studying, for instance, in Kerala. You have small groups of women coming together and, uh, and uh, cooperating on farming. There are many other examples. In France, I remember, I visited, and you have group farming, where you have complex systems coexisting because the, the land area that, even 15 hectares, is not a bad piece of land to have if you want uh, to have a landscape which is more complex, multiple crops, bit of poultry. I found that in Brazil uh, under the agroecology movement, just 15 hectares, 20 hectares, and you could have that. So some way of institutionally consolidating farms without losing your property rights to the farms. And that, I think, is a way that we, we do need to uh, perhaps think about more and move forward. It is possible. Just one uh, other small, uh, and uh, this is my final comment. Um, I, in Rio, we talked about um, Rio Plus 20, green growth. Everybody is talking about green economy. I do believe we need to distinguish between green growth and green development, um, because it comes back to the issue of values, that green growth can take place without any um, particular emphasis on equality, on poverty, or, uh, and social inclusion, whereas green development does mean that you both conserve and that you include um, so that people have a right to improve well-being. And I think sometimes that distinction helps because many governments in the South are and in the North are really so concerned about simply growth and then greening it with a bit of technology rather than the broader notion of green development. Green growth with, with equity is what Indonesia talks about. But it, Christian, Christian, what yes. about landscape, landscapes without forests? How does that sound to a conservation biologist? Uh, there are plenty of landscapes that don't forest. Uh, there are many degraded lands that should have forests and things like agroforestry. I mean, let's not forget these marginal lands that for a whole bunch of reasons historically could be brought back. And there are some areas, natural ecosystems, that don't have forests. But it's certainly my concern is some of the key areas of forest that we have that are very important for conservation and for services and for livelihoods, we need to identify them and to make sure that we conserve some of these. And part of the solution is going to be clearly the way we do the agricultural development and how, where and how we do it is key. And I, I fully agree that, I mean, a lot of it, local practices, engaging the local stakeholders, whether it's a small farmer in the Andes or or a farmer in Ontario, uh, the, these are the people that are there working in the ground and we need to do it. But I think clearly so many of these issues have to be thought of in a broader scale. It's not just what you're doing there. Uh, you, the production, as was just said, in your farm will depend so much on the external factors, rain, climate change, so many areas that are external. And what you do there is going to have an impact outside. And I think we need that's where the landscape issue, it's an issue of looking at your choices there. I do think there's institutions, there's policies, and the markets. I mean, I think we're starting to see some interesting changes in markets that are starting to push production systems in a particular direction. I mean, we see in many of the commodities now, we've been encouraged to see what's happening in Brazil with soy. I mean, the fact that a whole bunch of companies and the big commodities traded like Cardiol will say zero deforestation soy and will take everything else out of the food chain. What we've seen is the rate of deforestation Mato Grosso has decreased by more than 50%. I think it's the companies, but it's the consumers ultimately. I think we're seeing more informed consumers making more choices, demanding certain pressures, paying some premiums, and I think that's part of the solution. But having said that, I am not willing to put all my eggs in the basket of markets because I think there are choices that are longer-term implications, that are societal goods, and where we do need governments and policies that are thinking of the of the greater good and future generations. So I, I, I'm very hesitant about it. I think markets have a role to play, but uh, I also think we need governments and strong policies that are looking after those areas. So Kwesi, all these new technologies, new ideas, integrated solutions from the bottom up uh, that, that we're studying in the CG, uh, it's, uh, it's agroforestry, it's also other forms of integration, it's agrofisheries, it's, it's a whole range of technologies and, and the farming practices. How do we take that to the political arena and, and make the politicians and the finance institutions understand? 
Yeah, I think that that's a very important uh, question because whatever we do, if we are not able to do it in such a way that the political and the high policy level players are part of it, uh, we don't go really far. So I think that's one of the challenges. Um, sometimes we declare victory too early. Uh, when we stay within our own levels and we do our little bits of research, you know, we can show all the evidence scientifically that we are successful. But I think we need to be able to define success from the point at which we are able to change the situation that we want to you know, transform. And to do that, it will mean bringing together uh, a whole cross-section of uh, sectors to be part of the, the whole research development effort. So in the context, for instance, of uh, the Humitropics program, we have what we call the innovation platform approach or the research for development platform, where for a particular locality, you want to identify what are the critical actors that are necessary to bring about the ultimate change. And those actors include the community, it includes you know, the NGO groups, it includes the local policy makers, and it includes also looking at who are the ultimate policy level you know, people that have to be informed or involved. So the whole idea of working together is to ensure that they can all help in the priority setting mechanisms and therefore, when something comes out, it doesn't take anybody by surprise. I think we from the research spectrum need to do a lot more in making sure that we are adequately involving both the communities and the policy makers, uh, not to mention the, the private sector and the other groups. And that's why this multi-sectoral dimension uh, is important. Since I have the floor, let me also make a comment on the fact that I did mention in my first contribution that it is important that agriculture must see itself also as producing ecosystem services. And I think the question that will be asked is, how does that happen? When you start going into how, it's really about increasing the carbon stock of the system that we're using. It's about bringing in the agroforestry dimensions, bringing trees to the farm, which everybody appreciates is a key element in there. It's about getting communities. And let me just give you one very quick example when Pedro and I used to work for aircraft, and uh, I had a project in southwestern Uganda, which is a very hilly uh, location. And here was a situation where you have farmers across the slope. And those down there, their biggest problem was the fact that boulders were coming from the upper elevations and coming down, and some of them were very you know, dangerous. But when you go to the upper slope, these people, they have the trees and they have to take out the trees because that's what gives them the energy they need for doing various things. And somehow, there was no connection between the upper layer and the lower layer. Now, through an initiative that was actually led by the aircraft team there, working with the local national agroforestry uh, groups, they brought this community together. And the community then began to look at what is, it, what is best for our community. Talking about landscape, you know, it's really the, 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 the technique of being able to bring all these communities together, give them a platform to deliberate, and then it's a question of really making some decisions and some hard choices on give and take basis. And ultimately, you are able to come up with a mechanism that is beneficial to both those on the upper slope as well as those on the lower slope. So this, this is an example of the fact that it is really important that we don't just go in and zero in on one cluster of farmers and do things without considering the negative, the, the externalities to the other you know, sectors of the landscape, but that we're able to bring the community together and explore these issues uh, together. And maybe on all levels, from the yes. COP negotiations to the individual farmers. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of more comments from, from the floor, and then we have to round off. Christopher, and one more. No more? Okay, one more. And after that, we, we, we have a final short comment, and then we're done. Christopher, please. Hi. Yeah, my Does it work? Yeah. yeah. My name is Christopher Martius. I'm a principal scientist for climate change at C4. And, and uh, I, I want to make a point that, that is bothering me, bothering me for some time now. Uh, we are all working, and we are all in agreement that we need integrated approaches, that we need landscape approaches, that we need to bring 
things that are divided because this, this isolated pursuit of sectoral interests has, has put us in the situation we are in, in terms of, of uh, uh, po poverty, de uh, development issues, uh, climate issues, uh, uh, degradation issues, and so on. But on the other hand, um, we're always making the problem bigger and bigger by adding more, more and more layers. And if you remember that Caesar said, divide and conquer, he didn't say integrated landscapes approaches and then conquer. So can we learn something from that? I think in order to make the problem tractable, we have to make it smaller. We have to put it in, in divide it into little pieces we can tackle. And we also have to consider that while we have certainly to build the, the analytical capacity uh, f to, ad to address these integrated problems, we also have to, con to, to, to be aware of the fact that the world is divided. There is no ministry of everything. There are ministries of finance, of forests, of, of, of agriculture. There is no ministry of landscape mostly. So we need to, I think we need to find a way and we need to make an effort of, of developing integrated analysis, but then break it down again into little pieces and chunks that can be digested by these sectoral entities that are still out there and they will be out there for a long time and maybe forever. So we need to find a way of making it tractable again. Thank you. That goes back to the comment of tension between existing structures and new solutions. Uh, final okay. comment? Um, I'm Chuck Rice at Kansas State University, also a board member for CI. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit different approach to your comment. Actually, one a uh, group that we haven't thought about is the training of students and how we train those. Uh, we tend to focus on training into a specialty, uh, agronomy, soil science, uh, forestry, ecology, whatever, and we tend to think about those little pieces. And if we're going to integrate the landscape, we got to think about how you diversify, manage and diversify the landscape because you're not going to have zero emissions from a field. You're not going to have zero runoff. And so it's managing that landscape to capture those zero, those emissions that whether it's sediment or gases or whatever. But we don't train our students to think and we, our disciplines have become zero narrow. So we need to think about how we train our students to work in teams to work with the ecologists that might be working in the riparian zone, to work with the agronomist that works on the field. And that's part of the uh, funding mechanism, the policies, how we train students, but they, we need to think about how we train those students to work in teams, because they're going to be the ag advisors and the landscape managers, or advising for the landscape, and maybe they'll be policy makers, I don't know. Okay, thanks. So uh, maybe negotiation should be a topic in the agriculture <laughs> curriculum. Um, okay, we have very few minutes. What's your one-liner take-home message from, from the session? Bina. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, back to me. Uh, firstly, I think there are just two comments. One is uh, oh, there only are... One, only one. Okay, only one. Um, uh, empower uh, and negotiate. Uh, empower the disadvantaged in order that they can negotiate um, and uh, have scientists actually work with the most disadvantaged farmers. So you can have multidisciplinarity. I completely agree that we need to break down these silos, but then have them work with farmers more directly, and especially women. Negotiation. Crazy. I will use my last minute to basically follow up on initiatives that are being done to enhance this landscape approach. And I'd like to show this document, a reference was made to it. This is the African Landscape Action Plan, which is a process that is led by the Eco Agriculture Partners, but which is really bringing together communities, research groups, forestry groups, agriculture groups, not necessarily to do everything by everybody, you know, but really to be able to understand the cross-cutting elements and be sensitive to where the trade-off analysis issues are. So I would say more effort should go into moving forward on these type of initiatives. So initiatives that bring together the landscapes. Yeah. And, and the, again, there's a little bit of negotiations in that. Christian. We need more spaces where we bring these communities together, um, the various fields like this. 
One thing, since this is so focused on CG and the role of the CG, I would really like to see the CG recognized by 2020 as a major leader in the environment. That's Meaning a that <laughs> we're fundamentally going to shape the future of the planet from the agricultural production system. I think just discussing the research framework in one of the other sessions, maybe Fair you enough. want to stay. <laughs> maybe I'll go, but I wish. Okay, great. Uh, I think we should give a big hand to our panel. Thank you very much for attending. And I know that there, are, there is a housekeeping announcement, which I have no clue what it is, but it has to do with lunch, I think. Who, who knows? Whoever knows has, has left, so they probably left for lunch already. Uh, there is lunch. I, th I think it's downstairs. No lunch. Yes, uh, yes. There's a lunch. Okay, good. Um, the lunch are what we call grab and goes. So you can go downstairs and pick them up. It's a box lunch. There's probably different kinds of vegetarian, and then you can take it and and network during this time with uh, friends and colleagues. Thank you. It's just right downstairs.